And push! And body! Jim actually wanted to up the scale. We made the models and the, and the set sets, the whole environment. Half again as big as the first time. The HK stood about four feet tall. The set was about 50 feet wide, 30 feet deep, with a sort of forced perspective at the horizon. Explosion! At Fantasy II, Peter Kleinau go motion animated the one-third scale Endo puppet from the first film in front of a pair of rear projected VistaVision plates showing a smaller scale miniature landscape and explosions. Two different versions of these puppet shots were then rear projected side by side behind a pair of full scale Stan Winston Endo puppets, which were shot handheld with smoke and spotlights. Finally, animated lasers were optically added to complete the shot. Arnold walks into the bar wearing the loudest pair of purple Hawaiian print board shorts that he can. <laughs> and everybody in the bar is supposed to keep a straight face. But it actually worked okay because they all looked down in surprise. And what he was trying to go for was the effect that they're all reacting to his enormous crank, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep his own mythology alive. So obviously he's framed from the waist up. And he's, so, so now that you've got the image of Arnold walking through the bar with these purple, you know, Hawaiian print board shorts on, you'll never see the scene the same <laughs> way. And I think, I think he was wearing a pair of brown bass weegins as well. Stan Winston built a pop-open kind of flower effect that had a, uh, had a mylar interior. And uh, only when you see the, uh, the wounds disappearing and healing are they CG effects. When they're appearing, they're actually a physical gag done on the set. It was basically a rubber shirt that was spring-loaded from the inside and, and triggered by a remote control by radio. It was actually a pretty seamless blend, I think. I mean, I, I certainly know where the differences are, but, but I think that, that in the flow and the cutting of the film, it's a pretty seamless blend of, of physical prosthetic gags with CG gags. Lucas has come out into the street and gets whacked this way. <laughs> I mean, like, if I get into trouble... Uh, uh, no, by mason over to the guide table. Okay, here we go. Roll camera, roll camera. Jim actually came up with the idea of counterbalancing the motorcycle on cables that he could compete and take out the cables later on. So what we actually did is put a digital tension meter on the crane cable and we would let off cable as the bike came out and uh, we'd bleed off to maybe a 200 pound drop versus a 900 pound drop which you normally have. So that way we were able to do the stun over and over. Here we go. And action. Side you. Boom. Good. Familiar? Yeah. My face didn't age at all. No. Not at all. Too much emotion. 
Yeah, exactly. What's going on here? Just a minute earlier. Yeah, exactly. Early part of the shoot. Was before my method acting uh, yeah. seminar. <laughs> I swear I will not kill anyone. Action. Action. Oh, we know exactly this. Right. Burn a hole! Here we go. And action! Richard! Rear projection is a, is a very old-fashioned technique, and a lot of people don't use it anymore, but we used it on Terminator 2, and it gives you a great deal of control and safety with the actors. And you can do some pretty outrageous stuff that you couldn't really do. I mean, you couldn't put an actor up on top of a moving car on a soundstage. In a night scene, especially, where you can get away with more visually uh, with rear projection, it just gives you a lot more control. So I would definitely prefer rear projection versus, say, blue screen composite, because I can manipulate the elements you know, through the lens. Quiet now. This is, you see, there's a mirror image, there's a camera here, there's a camera here. There's you here, there's a there. Wow. Why, Arnold? You getting tired of it? Does it feel? Okay, I'm just trying to get it out or out of the camera. No, it's okay, we like the light. We like the light. It took a while to, to make Eddie feel at ease with me because he has seen so many of my films and he felt kind of intimidated. And so I paid a lot of attention to that and made a real effort to play around on a set a lot with Eddie and play games with him and talk to him a lot and, and be like a big brother to him, to make him look at me like a friend, like a fellow actor that he's working with, that he can have fun with so that within a short period of time after we started filming he felt very much at ease his acting got much better because of that we had much a much better relationship with our scenes which was very crucial so and he had a, a fantastic acting coach and i think that jim cameron paid a lot of attention to his uh, work uh, and his acting <laughs> <laughs> Jay Roth at Electric Image, who had been developing some animation software uh, for Macintosh, eventually what he generated was several elements that wound up being incorporated into a matte painting. And we built a series of metal racks that were the substructure of the buildings. Across from the buildings, about nine feet away, was a row of air cannons, several ridders and e-fans, delivering a solid wall of air into these models. We essentially did three cameras photographing the entire setup at once. It was either eight or nine times that we did those over. The reset time averaged two and two and a half days. Thank you. 
Michael Haney, give me a report. Are the stuntmen all right? Action! Nice work, Tommy. Okay, run, man. The live stunt was shot with seven cameras at the Fremont location. The main camera was locked off to get separate plates of the bike jump and the helicopter flyby. These two elements were optically composited together by Pacific Tidal, who also optically removed the stunt cable to complete the shot. It felt great. Uh, there was plenty of clearance. We had about three and a half feet on each blade tip, and, uh, and uh, everything just worked out just the way it was supposed to, just the way uh, we talked about it, rehearsed it, and uh, just no problems at all. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, son. That's it, another one of Jim's deals here. We're on our limits, slugs again. <laughs> They'll be out by Christmas time for all your yeah. kids. <laughs> it was a quarter scale miniature which made it 18 feet long. The set was 70 feet long. The asphalt area into the miniature factory buildings was 20 feet wide. The whole reason why you do some of these things in miniatures, when it's smaller, you're controlling it, it is destroyed. When you roll it over, you patch it up a little bit and you do it again. You know that you're going to do it over and over until you get it. We actually put the casters on and built the truck and we, where we had to tie actually the trailer to the, the tractor so you don't get a lot of swing. And the, the effect screw basically builds anything that you need specialized for a car, for a wreck, because stunts and effects work hand in hand. These full-sized replicas of the real steel pores were hollow and filled with lights behind a plexiglass surface. Even the cast resin pore stream had lights behind it. Methacil was pumped to pour down the stream like a waterfall to create movement. Hidden effects guys would use arc welders to generate sparks above and below the dish. Embers were liberally strewn around the floor. Then smoke was pumped in to complete the effect. A second version had a backlit spill down the front of the dish and a backlit plexiglass floor with progressive cutouts defining the shape of the spill. Add ember to the edges and voila! He went through tons of different things trying to find something that wouldn't settle out. The one that seemed to, to work out the best was a thin layer of, of oil and powdered sugar, as thin as we could possibly get it, over about three and a half feet of water in the deepest part. So what, what makes it white? Uh, it's the emulsion of the, of the water and the sugar and the, so it's and the air. It's just getting all coagulated. The clear water gave it a base to rest on, allowed a clear medium for the light to pass through, and it ended up diffusing the light well, and it was non-toxic, which was important too because of having our actors in there.
some of the people from the mill that have come up from a distance, they thought the ladle was real, they thought it was one of ours. This is as realistic as you can get and, and not actually have hot metal. It looks very real. Well, when my head squished, so We call this Cleave Man. It's Robert Patrick. It's there. It's not a computerized effect. It's going to be fun. Half of him is a robotic effect that he had to wear. So we situate it in such a way that you can only see part of his body, built another part of his body onto him, and then had that part of his body able to plop out and start its way back up. The arms that the cables are attached to are actually spring-loaded. So when these cables are yanked out quickly, they release the springs, which flop the uh, sides of the flower open. Firing the mechanism. And up a little. Boom. Oh, that actually works. I always feel when I'm dealing with actors, if I'm asking them to do something, I want to know what it feels like to do it. I want to have already done it or some, something like it. If I'm, if, I'm, if I'm asking them to do something stupid or do, it doesn't feel right, I don't think you can just stand back in the distance and just say, do that. I have to kind of get in. And often when I'm blocking out an action sequence, I'll go in and I'll do some of the fight moves myself and I'll feel what it's like. To so then I pass that on to the actors and we try to keep the, the set as safe as possible. We call this Pretzel Man because when he was designed, he looked like a pretzel. He started off in a, in a position that is semi there, that couldn't possibly be a guy in a makeup or a guy in a suit. And then he is literally splatted apart and he's all over the place. And it's all done with.